Welcome in, people. I'm so excited to have you back, and I'm really excited for what we have planned for this episode. So, first off, again, big law capitalist. A lot of people ask me, you know, why should I listen to the show? Like, you know, what 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 are you guys trying to you know do with this? So, the point of the show is to teach you how to start adding passive income to your portfolio, but while also maintaining your current profession, right? So, like, you want to find ways to add to your portfolio without taking away from what is, you know, I consider your active income, right? So it's about adding passive income. One big piece of that is if you're investing in real estate, you're like, where do I invest? I get that question a lot. Well, the question really is more so, what can I invest in that's not going to take away from my regular day job, take away from my time, but that I feel comfortable with? That's really the question. And so even if you're not investing in your backyard, right? People say like, oh, well, I need to lay eyes on it. Like, do you, right? Like, if you're investing in the stock market, are you really laying eyes on that? I don't think. No. But are you keeping track of that company? Outside of financials they may disclose, which you may or may not even look at, you're just looking at the stock price, right? So that's where we're trying to get to. Today's guest is a fantastic person to talk to about that because I think it will introduce you to a new market that a lot of people don't really think about who are living outside of the Pennsylvania area, which is Pittsburgh. So my, my friend, my buddy, really good friend of mine, a guy I've invested with, a uh, guy I've, I've invested alongside of, uh, John Wappler. He is the president of Evergreen Development uh, Company, and he is one of the smartest people I know. So without further ado, I want to bring him in, and I want to dive in. John, thanks for joining us, man. Absolutely. How's it going? It's going well, dude. I appreciate you jumping on, man. We're uh, you know kicking off this show, so I like to I like to have you know good friends, but also people who I think add a ton of value. So you obviously came to mind first thing. Yeah, I'll do my best. Yeah, man. Well, hey, so I, I kind of gave a brief intro as far as who you are, you know, what you're about. But I'd love if you could kind of give us, you know, two or three minutes of like, hey, this is who I am. Like, this is how I got it started, got started investing. Yeah, sure thing. So my name is John Wappler. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I run a company called Evergreen. So our company, uh, we're a real estate acquisitions and asset management business. We buy and hold multifamily and single family properties to generate an income and equity growth stream for ourselves and for our clients. Um, We're all based out of Pittsburgh. So all of our assets are here right now. Grew up here, went to college pretty locally. I played uh, volleyball at St. Francis University, graduated early, kind of came back into the same area and have been here ever since. And what what did you do post post undergrad, right? Did you stick around? Like, how did that work? So I ended up actually working for a private equity firm uh, called Prime Rock Capital. They were based out of downtown. They were small. They did mostly like leverage buyouts for small manufacturing companies, angel investments in tech companies, and had some real estate investments as well. And that's actually nice. how I got transitioned into real estate. So I picked up a project on my own, you know, thinking maybe watching too much HGTV or whatever, <laughs> uh, a flip, you know. Didn't really understand everything at the time, but it went really well. Um, yeah. So started out with that, had one project, just did it while I worked a W-2 job, and then had a basically this goal of, you know, getting out of W-2. I, I don't know that it was as planned as I'd like to think it is now, right? But had that, you know, get to the office at 6 a.m., leave the office at 8, 10 p.m., and kind of was, you know, mid-20s, wanted to start a family at some point. So figured needed to build the reverse engineer, build my schedule. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah kind of like uh like lifestyle hacking, if you will. Um, that's awesome. man. I, I guess I didn't realize too, like, so uh, before you kicked off Evergreen, you, you were, how long were you at the, the PE firm? So I, I ended up graduating college a year early. So I was there 2011 to 2014, like basically right at the nice. beginning of 14 and then started out on my own from there. And we, we started with, when I started on my own, I, I mean, I had largely nothing, right? What I'd built in a career for three years in terms of cash, so not a ton, but had the backing right. of the private equity group that I was with to an extent, nice. right? That had had a lot of uh, constraints on that backing. But if deals fit the right framework, we had built a really good relationship. They were happy to jump in. Their model was uh, not long-term. Everything was short-term. Like deals were like one-year horizon. Um, so right. it was get in, get out, 
execute the strategy. And we started doing a couple of deals together that way, uh, buy a portfolio and break it down and sell it, sell it off with the idea that, you know, you can make more money selling each house individually than you could if you bought the whole thing, took care of one landlord's problem. So we, we started right. that, uh, in 2014 and myself and partner from the, the company that I was with. And mm -hmm. basically, you know, I'd come to learn firsthand the tax implications that come from, uh, mm -hmm. you know, buying and selling real estate for a profit and right. basically wanted to make something that wasn't so much that you have to like eat what you kill every year, right? Where you have to yep. go in buy, you have to find a new project because you're buying it, you're renovating it, and then you're selling it. You've got nothing. It had no longevity. So right. what we started, I did that from 2014, call it to 2018. And then over that period kind of learned that uh, there was another way to do it. And we had operated a portfolio of rentals over that time by virtue of just buying them. And as we'd divest them, a lot of the portfolio would operate it over the course of that time. But it never right. amounted to like where we had several hundred units or something like that. Um, right. So that. And th at this point, were you, were you, when you guys were kind of making the, the pivot, you know, into the longer term stuff, were you also still managing your own properties or were you kind of, because at, at this point, you're kind of out of the W2 phase, but you're, you know, still early on as a company. And I know that there's some, you know, economies of scale that come with, you know, having a bigger portfolio. So early on, I'm thinking, were you managing your, managing your own properties or what are your thoughts on the sort of the third party property manager at that point? Well, at that point, uh, I, I think my thoughts have, have come a long way. And <laughs> the, so I think single and multifamily is different in terms of mm -hmm. how you would manage it and how you want to manage it. Pittsburgh's a unique market in like its stock of housing and characteristics compared to some other larger cities where there's you know, not as many 400 unit communities here situations, right? right? So at the time we were doing scattered site single family portfolios. So they might mm -hmm. be within a 10 mile radius, but not all together, which is hard to manage. And there are, I, I did not find, and I still have not found someone in Pittsburgh that was qualified to they might have been qualified, but they never care about it the same way that you do when you own it. So we basically, right. you know, built a management team over time. It started with just me and I've added members to the team as we've gone along. You know, at the beginning, I did every phase of it from writing the leases, you know, posting the properties online, taking the pic, you know, literally everything. Right. Yeah. Um, and then have kind of built that out to now we've got a team and I, I don't really do much of that at all um, from a high level, right. we'll set the business plan from the property. And mm -hmm. once we set the business plan, the team kind of takes it from there. But I, and honestly, I think property management's largely a terrible business uh, to be like it's, an owner in, but it's tough, dude. Like that just, it, I can't, I mean, you guys do a great job at it, right? Like, but I think there's, it's for one, it's hard to be good at. And then two, I think the, one of the things is you are sort of, fighting the uphill battle of like margins, right? Like, I feel like it's like a, it's a margin game that's, you know, volume is sort of the name of the game. And if you don't have the volume, you're in the margins are already slim. So it's like a, it doesn't make a ton of money unless you can kind of do it in a way that there are some efficiencies kind of built into the system. For us, it's like a break even mechanism. I, I don't need to make a, or care to make a profit on the management side. It's just to perform, right? If we write the pro mm -hmm. forma that we're going to have, 4% vacancy repairs are going to be this, and we're going to collect that in rent. We have to hit that. And it's a control based problem. So we didn't have the control we wanted. So we ended, you know, ended up kind of building it. And I, I have tried several third party property managers at the, you know, at the mm -hmm. beginning, and I would try and asset manage them. It worked, but their own internal problems, you know, ended up being excuses. And they basically just aren't the size that you need to be to have enough people that you can fill yep. in when one person goes down. And I think right. that it definitely exists. I think if you're doing larger scale multifamily, you know, having a regional property manager or a national property manager absolutely is a great way to go. It's one of the ones I, I just think as an activity, uh, if you don't have to do it yourself and somebody can do a good enough job at it, you know, I'd be happy to turn this over to someone. And I, there is a point when you get to like 5,000 units where you can bring it back in house and you have a ton of economies of scale. You basically have your own property management firm and it makes sense. But for sub that on the multifamily end, I think the third party is the way to go.
And and you not only have you built out sort of the management part of it, but like I think there's there's a number of sort of you know subcategories within real estate investing where you've built out not only management but then also general contracting piece, right? So you've you've built companies within companies. If it feels like a sort of inception style, yeah, yeah. Well, it's <laughs> it's all control and need based thing. The construction mm-hmm. business was another. Um, we did a development locally and started in 2015 and had a you know over the years we've always had kind of this like value add strategy right where Mm -hmm. the idea is that there could be management inefficiencies that you can go in and cure those but like nine times out of ten the deficiencies that you see are like capex related where you have to go in and refresh units to you know bump your rents and match the market or you know some major capex implementing those type of programs and you know it was same situation a lot of people deal with having a hard time with contractors and you know Mm -hmm. sticking to budgets and things like that and and all the things that can go awry with contractors so uh due to some which are so many things right all the fun fun problems that you can have there uh but we ended up building our own construction company to kind of have some control over that and control over the labor sources and material prices and standardization of products so that we could yep. kind of do everything in a uniform fashion on time on budget so we i think those are i think that's where we're going to leave it uh i feel like every other vendor and and stuff that I, we don't want to get like more spread out than that but the right. construction uh and construction management business has been instrumental to implementing our business plan in pittsburgh um in terms yeah. of like just again hitting the time hitting the budget knowing the budget and it really helps with speed of analysis on some of the deals if the um you know if you have a proposal where you're going to buy 25 units and you know 20 of them need overhauled well if you don't right. we have the we have estimators we can tell exactly what that's mm-hmm. going to be quickly we're going to get the attention and you know all the resources that came out of that that's been super helpful to us and that's been one of the things i've loved about you know working with you guys you know uh between new homes and evergreen i think the the fantastic part has been like when we partner up, it's not, you know, we're not like counting on, okay, we, we have this business plan and we need X, Y, and Z to line up in a in, you know, perfect line, right? So with you guys, it's like, well, we're partnering with a, a well-known, well-established operator in the, in the region, you know, high degree, you know, high reputation, obviously, but then also on top of that, your ability to manage and then your ability to handle the, the CapEx piece, like it, it ensures that whatever business plan we're sort of pitching, is the one that we're actually going to be able to make make happen, right? So like that's that's huge, man. I'm glad you guys have done that because it's it's benefited a lot of people, myself included. So yeah, I appreciate it. Hey, we're we're happy for for all of that, and I and I think um, yeah, we can jump into this in a little bit too. But I think putting together the pro forma at the beginning of a deal, it look everything looks great on paper. Right. It's about hitting the numbers, and if you can't hit the numbers, yeah. then the whole thing was worthless. So you got to uh, yep. figure out a way to get, you know, to keep that on track. So that's, that's what we've tried to do. And I, I appreciate all the kind words there. Well, dude, I, uh, so no, for sure. And, and one of the things I, I tell people, cause people come to me a lot of times, you know, especially in our, in, in the legal industry and they're like, how are you doing what you're doing? And I'm like, well, I'm not creating another job for myself. Right. Like, you know, anybody can, you know, people will come to me and they'll say like, Hey, I found this really good deal. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. Like, what is it? And they'll, you know, mention the the purchase price and mention like the renovations. And then that's how much ARV is going to be afterwards. And I'm like, okay, that's cool, man. Like, let's get to that middle part, that renovation piece. I would just tack on 25% right? and I'll tack on an additional six months. Cause like, yeah, you don't have time. If you're a legal professional, I can promise you from experience, like you genuinely don't have time to add that extra bit to your lifestyle, right? Like if you're working, billing hours that we bill and on top of that, if you have a family, like. You're not going to want to also manage contractors. And so like what I tell people is build it into your numbers up front, right? Build that stuff in, do the underwriting the right way. Or better yet, if you're truly looking to make it passive, shop that out to an operator, right? Shop that out to somebody who does this for a living, who's looking for those deals. That's what makes the most sense. So, I mean, what you're saying makes a ton of sense. And I think a lot of people who are listening to this will get a lot of value out of that because there's no reason to to reinvent the wheel when somebody's doing it well already. 100%. And it, it, I think it goes, you can apply this to a lot of different things, but somebody mm-hmm. that is doing it every single day has just a little bit more like sway 
you know, they have relationships and that goes a long way in terms of getting people to the job yep. site and getting the performance to, to be there. So it's not that it can't be done, but it's also what's your time worth at the end of the day as well. Um, you know, if yeah. I, I imagine, especially a lot of the guys, you know, are, are making a lot more than it would, you know, a project manager would cost effectively. Right. So it's like, if right. you, exactly. if you're boiling that all down, it's absolutely worth outsourcing that component. Well, many it's, components, especially, especially for, for lawyers, right? Like I think, you know, we're, we, we kind of make our money. We know the kind of, we do make our money based on our time. Right. So like you actually quantifiably know on a day-to-day -day basis, how much your time is worth. And so yep. thinking through that, you know, and making sure that, that other people, you know, or, you know, people you are trying to control, right. Third party, you know, property managers, third party, um, you know, contractors aren't then taking away from what otherwise makes you your money, right. That you're, that you're good at the value add that you add, you know, to, to the, to the, um, you know, sort of to the equation. So, so I want to pivot on that because I think we've talked about Pittsburgh kind of, you know, on the periphery, but, you know, with the current landscape, right, like with things, how things are sort of shifting, right, you know, rates are going up, you know, we're headed towards what feels like a recession, you know, GDP has been, you know, slowly creeping down. Yeah. And so I want to ask you, you know, where do you, where do you stand on the current landscape, you know, maybe specifically talking about Pittsburgh at first, and then just kind of broader in a broader sense like how do you feel about the current investing landscape so i think it's an interesting time because there's been a lot of external factors that have affected the multifamily single family market that nobody could have predicted and then we're mm -hmm. feeling those effects right now from stimulus checks to work from home to unemployment all of the to rising home prices to compressing cap rates and rising interest rates, right? All of that is like coming to this point where what, what do you do today, right? Rates are going up every single day. Right. Cap rates aren't seeming to decompress in the way that they should. Um, you know, yep. my feel for the market <laughs> is actually is not much different than where we normally are. I mm -hmm. still feel like the value that is there needs to be created, right? I, we right. don't manage a large pool of funds, right? We're not managing a billion dollars and we're making a capital allocation to real estate as a part of a larger portfolio. And, and we just sit there and let it, right? This is an actively managed investment where we're seeking deals that earn a targeted return. The deals still exist. Yep. You have to work a little harder to get them. Um, where we've had all of our luck during the pandemic and mostly prior to is creating off-market relationships where you can have honest conversations with the seller and negotiate based off of real terms, right? You see a lot yeah. of these deals, they hit loop net and, you know, the pro forma, it looks really good, but all of the numbers oh, on there that, are made up, net. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we like to work off T12 income statements, just figure out what the last 12 months actually were and run our numbers for that. So as long as we're in this like positive environment uh, for interest rates where in where cap rates are higher than interest rate, I think there's still a lot of good opportunities when they flop and interest rates are higher than cap rates. It will change things a little bit, but what's really mm -hmm. unique uh, about right now is what you're seeing. And you see this every day too, is like how sponsors are modeling deals, right? They, they right. say the last year we've had in Pittsburgh, 14% rent growth. And then they extrapolate that over the next five years. Well, that, yeah, just carry it forward. Right. Right. That's highly unlikely to happen. Yeah. <laughs> right. Although I understand how you come up with those trends. Um, so we've kind of been building these pro formas to have no additional rent growth. And you look at that as basically, you know, gravy if it happens. Right. We, we want right. the deal to work right. for its current capabilities or what its current capabilities could be if you were to like, you know, bring it back to the marketplace. Right. We're always looking for these, like yep. what we call lazy assets, maybe owners owned it for 15, 20 years, maybe shorter, but they haven't caught rents up to where they could be. If rents are a dollar a square right. foot and the portfolios rented at 50 cents, you know, you have a gap that you can bring that up. And as long as you have a reasonable period of time to do it and an appropriate budget to update those units to get there, the deals still exist. Um, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily subscribe to the belief that trees grow to the sky. Right. I think there's going to be a ceiling at some point with 
uh, some of the right. asset values, but it it's going to continue to grow slowly. Um, I think the opportunities that we're seeing are going to come from people that have made bad assumptions at one point in time, right? They took out right. bridge debt based on, you know, hitting some pretty optimistic growth targets or building something with some pretty optimistic assumptions that may or may not come true. And being yep. able to jump on and capitalize on those opportunities is going to be uh, very important. I think that's where we're kind of putting our efforts. So we're not um, actively not, we're, we're always looking, right? Deal development is like a critical, one of the four pieces that we're working on for our business every single day. Um, right. I think the national market, uh, there's a lot of, I don't know if it's disagreement. Maybe it seems to be like everybody feels like, there's an undersupply of housing, but, um, right. I, you know, if you ever read any of Ivy Zellman stuff, I think she's really well polished on this and kind of doesn't believe that there is, it's more of like a factor of like who's moved in with family and how you actually view the housing stock. I, I think right. if we oversupply housing, that would be the concern from a national level. But, you know, mm -hmm. I, um, I think that same original Pittsburgh philosophy is going to apply largely again doing deals with good fundamentals across the country and i do think rates will cap rates are going to decompress a little bit here um uh, you know yeah i feel like they have to right like i mean just the, the way the fundamentals work i feel like they have to sort of widen at a certain point yeah otherwise it's going to be you know unless rent growth continues to just surge um that's the only way you'll be able to do deals and right you know stay above water effectively mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. And so I, yeah, that, that's, that's a really good point because people will ask me like, well, Hey, like, should I even touch commercial real estate right now? Should I touch real estate in general? And I'm like, there's never a time that I'm, that you're going to convince me not to at least be out looking for deals and not to sort of find opportunities. Right. But that's the key. Right. And that, that's any market. I mean, even when it was, it was free money for a while, right. When, when capital was like, Oh yeah, we'll just kind of, we'll give this away 2%. There you go. Yeah. Like when that, even when that was happening, you still had to be savvy and find the opportunities. So it's just a matter of, you know, building it into your underwriting. I tell people, you know, no matter what, we're always underwriting conservatively because at the end of the day, if you were doing the pie in the sky math, you're going to end up with, you know, nothing garbage in hand, you know? So uh, we, we make sure that when I'm, when I'm telling people like, Hey, you know, do you want to get involved? It's not from a, because I want you to be involved. It's from a, because if you're not, somebody else is, right? Like yes. the, the John Wapplers of the world, like we are, you know, you're actively out there. You're still doing deals. It's just changing the the way your performance looks, changing the numbers, changing the equations so that it more so matched up with the realities of today, yeah. right? So yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point, um, which kind of gets me back to one of the earlier things we talked about, which was like when you cut your teeth in, in investing, when you're at the PE firm and you jumped out, did you expect to get to, and I guess this, I'll have a follow-up to this. Did you expect to get to the level you're at now? And also then where do you see yourself, right? Like kind of tell us, you know, where are you at now versus where you were back in 2014 when, when you were making the leap? 2014, right? We were at zero units. Well, with a, one unit under my belt as a sponsor, bunch under my belt as like an analyst, right? Underwriting deals, but that mm -hmm. doesn't count. Um, where right. the goal for me with this is like a passive income stream that you can, use and continue to build upon and an equity growth stream that you can use and continue upon build upon that was always the goal um we've eva like basically taken the strategy from the beginning and as things come into place fine-tuned it essentially with a residential focus but we're we're 180 homes right now locally uh that's somewhere mid 20 million assets uh here and then you know we're looking to probably double that uh within like the next three years as a goal um it's fantastic yeah, it's it's exciting that's just like that's jet fuel for anybody who who enjoys you know um investing and enjoys you know success man like that that's absolutely fantastic appreciate that yeah it's uh it's definitely i i don't know where i thought would be right i had goals at the beginning of st <laughs> starting a REIT and then like as we got into it and down the weeds for a REIT, the tax advantages aren't the same as they are in private real estate. There's a million reasons why we didn't go that direction, but absolutely. I right. don't know that I saw this directly, but you know, kind of keep building towards it and it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. So hey, so so just for some practical tips, right? For for people listening, you know, a lot of the people listening, don't get me wrong, 
highly educated people, right? Like who, who do very well, very successful, but at the same time, they don't do this day in and day out like me and you. So um, if they're looking at a deal, say a sponsor tosses them a deal, right? And they're like, okay, I have a pro forma in front of me, or I have, you know, this prospectus or this PPM in front of me, private placement memorandum sitting in front of me and I'm running through it. What are some metrics that you would tell, you know, somebody looking to invest with you or somebody investing with you who wants to look at another shop, right? Like, what would you tell them? What are some metrics you should look at from another sponsor or another deal? Let's make it a deal on a deal basis that would jump out to you and say like, hey, this is important. Look at this, right? Cash on cash, um, IRR. Like, what are some things you would tell people like focus on? Yeah, I, Listen, I think it's two different responses from whether you're the sponsor running the deal and how you kind of came up with those areas and things to select because it breaks it down like one level further back to start at like de mm -hmm. MSA data and picking the right MSA. And there's, mm -hmm. you know, several odd metrics we use to like screen MSAs. We're here in Pittsburgh, we know it. So it's our backyard and we kind of pick the sub markets because at the end of the day, real estate right. is hyper local, you know, period. And then kind of breaking down yep. some of that demographic data. Um, but as far as like comparing deals to themselves, um, and making sure that you, if you have several opportunities in front of you, pick the right ones. Uh, there's a variety of important factors, even before you get to the deal, like the sponsor is an important thing, right. right? Having trust with the sponsor, having a track record and having experience in the asset class. Those are like fundamentals to just, you know, even being considered to do that type of thing. Right. There's yeah. a, you know, I've heard this from several people before, but there's always that myth that, or I don't know that it's a myth, but like one of the typical real estate sayings, it's, you know, if you find a, a find a deal, the money will find you or, you know, great, right. but you need the person running the deal has to be a good operator. Otherwise they're yeah. not going to hit the budget in the pro forma that's set for the deal. And they may have found a good deal, but they may screw it up somewhere between purchase and sale. And, you know, so that's like step one. Uh, and you, there's a variety of ways you can evaluate that sponsor. Um, and a lot of it's going to be asking questions. It's a lot of it's going to be contained in their PPM. Um, right. Actual metrics. The I think the best metric is definitely IRR, right? It's the most mm. uh, neutral way to compare one project to the next. It's based on cash inflows and cash outflows, right? That is right. definitely important. I think an overlay to that and where people get aggressive, maybe overly optimistic on the IRR is when it's not heavily weighted enough in cash on cash returns. And a lot of those returns are based on appreciation. But this is a market specific right. thing that you can underwrite, right? You can look at if, if the deal's in Denver and they've had like 10% rent growth a year documented for 10 years, absolutely. You, you can bank at some point on that appreciation and the cap rate, you know, you buy at a four and a half cap rate and you exit at a four and a half cap rate. Perfect. It's going to be heavy IRR. It's going to be low cash on cash to start and building as time goes along. Yeah. Cash on cash, obviously a important metric, just the basically based on your upfront investment, what cash you're earning annually over that. Um, the good thing about IRR right. is it's independent of time, right? You're going to, if you have a project that's, you know, seven years versus a project that's one year, you know, people look at ROI effectively, but ROI doesn't take into account the time value of money. So it can be a bad metric for people to use. Um, right. I think yep. looking at, you know, if, if you want to get into how the sausage is made of some of the deals and people looking at like verifying the assumptions, do the market rents look good? Are the leverage ratios good? Uh, you know, what's the LTV? If you're looking at two deals and the IRR is the same and one uses 60% leverage and the other uses 80 it's a no brainer. Use this, go with the 60% leverage deal. It's less risky. Um, those type of things. I think one of the metrics we like to use too, that's not like conventional is like cap rate off of your basis, because it really shows you what you mm -hmm. would earn if you own the deal in cash. Um, and yep. then putting your own overlaying your own tax situation. Which I totally agree with it, that. It's nice to know because yeah. the cap rate is great metric and it, it functions effectively the same way. But if you have all these soft costs baked into the deal at the beginning, title, some improvements, whatever else. It, it's not a six cap. It's really like a five cap because you have to put an extra million dollars into the property and soft costs. But um, that's right. Yeah. Well, hey, let me let me let me change gears just real quick because 
before I before we dive too deep, I wanted to ask you, and I don't I don't don't want to miss that. We got a, a hard cap for yeah. the viewers. Um, which again, thank you to you, John, for joining us. But I wanted to chat with you just real quick. Your your why of it all, right? And I think I think it's you know building that sort of passive income. But is there like a a, a deeper reason as far as like your why, right? Like family, uh, legacy, any of that sure. stuff. Sure. Um, the why for me is, is family. Um, I feel like we're just super fortunate to be in the position that I'm in, right? You know, at some point, my every generation has got like one level of improvement goes from working in a coal mine to working in a factory, you know, right. to work in a like, you know, blue collar job. And, and it's kind of like in my family gone, like every dad has been able to step that up to the next level. So my objective with this right. is to like be able to provide for my family, maintain the flexibility to go to kids, sports games, uh, you know, whatever else be there as a dad, yep. but also be able to give my kids and family a platform that they can continue that improvement and help give back and things like that. So that's more so the why for me, uh, flexibility, family, that's awesome. uh, all of that. And, and again, kind of generating that income growth stream off of real estate, real estate yep. gives you a unique ability to do that as opposed to some other professions. It's not trading time for money, but you know, that's the point. Yeah. That's fantastic, man. Well, I, I gotta say, thank you so much. First off for jumping on. I know how busy you are. So I do appreciate it, man. Is there any, any social media you want to plug? I know uh, we're going to obviously toss it into the, the show notes, but if there's anything you want people to check out, feel free to yeah, plug it. We're not super big on social media, but we have our Instagram evergreen PGH and evergreen asset management. Um, one's our construction company. The other's our asset management company. So you can check us out there. Nice. Awesome. John, absolute pleasure as always. Uh, audience, my people, thank you for joining us. I really do appreciate it. At some point, jump in our comments, jump into our DMs. Tell us your why, right? Tell us why you're in, why you want to start investing, why passive income is important to you. Uh, loved having you on, John. Thank you, everybody else. Uh, we'll talk to you next time. Peace. All right, we did it. Thank you so much for joining me for this week's episode. I really, really do appreciate it. Do me a big favor. If you want to be a part of the Big Law Capitals community to stay up to date with all of our latest episodes, you got to hit that subscribe button. Super important. But I can't thank you enough for joining me this week. I'll see you next time. Peace.